Welcome, friends. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. When I travel by air, I have to pass through a device which checks how much metal I have. <laughs> My knees are made of titanium. And my teeth are titanium. Mm -hmm. But when I pass through that machine, somehow, the last three, four times I noticed, it also shows my shoulders are titanium. <laughs> I never replace the shoulders. And I asked them, there is no metal here. How is it showing up on the screen? He said, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And then I remember the old incident in which great master once was asking me to travel with him in the car and while we were traveling he had put his head on one side of the, of the shoulder and then on the way back on the other side and ever since then I have never felt they are my own. I felt they were great master's shoulders but I did not know that the electronic machines can detect it. <laughs> with this kind of new gadgetry now on me. If a little more metal, I'll become a bionic man. <laughs> I'm very happy to see all of you here. We have these monthly meetings so that we can stay on track on our spiritual path. Spiritual path deals with the spirit. It does not deal with the world. It does not deal with our body. It does not deal with our mind. It does not deal with our sense perceptions. It deals with the spirit. It deals with our real true self. In the last two weeks, some friends have sent me news items from the world of science. One of them says that we now found out that this world is not objective. There are professors of physics saying that, not some mystic or somebody. This world is not objective because by experiments they have created an event which two people have seen as entirely different. This quantum physics has messed up a lot of Science. The other news that came was that for the first time they have been able to reverse time and go back, though for a split second, they have been able to go back in the past. In physics and science. And the friends who said that to me have been saying, you have been saying this thing for a long time, for maybe 50, 60 years. I said, I have only been saying for 50, 60 years. Our Indian scriptures have been saying it for 7,000 years. Those who have found the spirit have been saying it for a long time. That the origin of this whole experience outside is, lies within ourselves and not outside. It's a subjective experience that we call objective universe. Very well crafted, I must say. It is so well done. The creation of a so-called objective reality has been so finely done. And the elements that have been used to make a subjective reality into an objective reality have been remarkable. If we go within our own self and try to find out what is the spirit? We are talking of spiritual path. What is our spirit? Some call it soul. What is the soul or spirit that we talk of? Is it some entity? Is it another body of this type? Or is it something different? Very difficult to define it. It's becoming more and more difficult to define it once we take the world to be an objective reality. If we take it as objective reality, we are so many people. 
seven billion sitting on this planet alone. We don't know how many are sitting on other planets. There's a very large number of individuals experience an objective reality. Are there so many souls? If there are so many souls, which one is creating the experience? Are they all creating the experience? What is the are the origin of this world several billions, trillions? Or is there one origin? When we go to religion for an answer, religion speaks of one God. Every religion speaks of one God, not billions of gods. Even in Hinduism, where they have created several gods and goddesses to divide the functions of nature, even there they have not gone into trillions as yet. But here we are talking of a world in which the souls are scattered in so many places. But supposing we were to take a different definition of soul or spirit, supposing we were to use the analogy of electric power. Electric power has come and we have 100 bulbs lighting. Are there 100 electric powers or one? Electric power is one. It's manifesting in 100 well, right? manifesting in this gadget, it's manifesting in fans, in all the computers, it's manifesting in trillions of things today. It does not make a trillion electricities. Electric power is one. Is the soul or spirit we talk of, of that nature, which would mean we are all participating in a single soul? A single spirit. If that is true, that would be quite consistent with the religious notion of there being one God, one creator. But we don't take it like that. The objective reality makes us forget that the origin of all of us is one. Because we haven't found the spirit. We haven't gone on the spiritual path to discover what the spirit is. When you will find the spirit, you will find it is only one. One soul generates the experience of trillions of souls. It's just a manifestation. It just manifests as an experience. Now, when we talk of objective reality, one has to consider how do we have knowledge of an objective reality? How do we know it exists? When we examine that question, the answer is startling. The answer is our whole knowledge, 100% knowledge of objective reality is coming from our sense perceptions. If the sense perceptions are shut off, there is no reality at all. That's amazing because sense perceptions are supposed to be working on our bodies. It's supposed to be working through organs on our body. How can the whole of the world be is being created by organs on the body? But there's a little catch there. Let me explain the catch. Let us take the most important sense perception, which gives us knowledge of an objective reality the power of vision, the capacity to see. We believe, and the professors of anatomy explain in great detail, that we see because we have eyes, physical organs. We have two eyes. How do they see? They explain that there has to be light outside to be able to see. If you make it totally dark, we can't see. Therefore, we are dependent on something called light. What does light do? Light consists of several colors. They just combined into one and they look like white light. When you put through a prism, 
or you put to you see the rainbow, the drops can create an image of the seven lights, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, red. I remember the names even. When I was teaching in they were teaching in the school, they said, remember the word Vip Cure, V I B G U I O R. Violet indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange light. I still remember. That is light. They say that light with these colors falls upon our eye and is refracted first by the cornea and then the aqueous humor inside, then the lens, then a vitreous humor inside and it falls on the back of the eyeball where we have the ending of the optic nerve in the form of rods and cones of a retina. This image falls because of refraction, image gets topsy-turvy and is upright, upside down. We should normally see things, everything upside down. Do you know till today they have not been able to answer why, if the image is upside down on the retina, why we see straight? They say we got used to it. That's not a scientific explanation at all. <laughs> but then what happens? They say that the rods and cones of the retina generate the form and the color. They pick up the color from that light and they separate the color and they separate the shapes and they then send a vibration signal to the optic nerve, to the brain. And the brain has a set area where the optic nerve ends. And when the message through a vibration, a frequent frequency of vibration reaches that place, we see what we are seeing outside. But one catch, to be able for this to function, we have to be conscious. If we are unconscious, eyes are open, we don't see. Therefore, if we are conscious and this image falls and the message is conveyed to the brain in the optic area, we see. Now, we don't know what consciousness is. We have no idea what is consciousness. When a person is conscious, he dies, consciousness disappears. The eyeball is still there, the brain is still there. Everything is intact except consciousness. He is not conscious anymore. Everything fades. What is that? Where has it gone? Have we any idea about consciousness at all? No idea at all. But we do know that people a small minority of people are able to hallucinate. What does hallucination mean? Hallucination means they are able to see things which we can't see. And they see it as clearly as we see. How do we explain that? If the whole process of seeing is as I've just explained, which is a scientific process, how can a person see in hallucination? Well, let's forget the hallucination. We close our eyes and do not allow any light to fall. And we imagine there is a beautiful waterfall and we can see the waterfall in our imagination. Are we seeing it? Is the seeing different? When we see with imagination, are we using something else? Well, how do we see imaginatively? What's the process for that? The outside light is not there. We can see in utter darkness. It's seeing the same thing as seeing with the light and the method that they are explaining how we see. Obviously, seeing is not the same thing as seeing with the eyes. We see dreams, very clear, lucid dreams. We see things we don't exist here. We go to other forms of experiences completely unrelated 
to this physical universe. How do we see? How can we say seeing is totally dependent upon the light falling upon objects and creating the images inside us? Seeing is separate. If seeing is not the same thing as physical seeing, we have to understand where is that coming from. Same thing applies to every other sense perception. In fact, during some of my meditation workshops, I start by telling people to imagine that they are sitting on a chair with flowers and a drink and some food to eat on the side and make them have all the five sense perceptions complete without any such object existing as part of an exercise. That means all five senses exist exactly without the physical organs. Have the physical organs created them? Or have they created the power in the physical organs to perform this function? Do we have a definite idea whether our ability to see is what makes these eyes see? Or these eyes have to see before we can see. Since we can see without eyes, the first idea would strike us. It is our ability to see that makes us see through these eyes. Which of course then justifies the very statement they are making now. The world is not objective. But being created by our power of having these sense perceptions independent of the organs of the body. And these powers that we have of using sense perceptions without the use of the physical organs, can it be separated from the physical organs completely? Or are they all built into the body that we have to use them only because they are embedded in the body? Can we imagine something without being in the body when we don't have that experience? Some people claim we have out-of-body experience. Some books have been written on people having near-death experiences, NDE. It's very nice to make short abbreviations of near-death experiences where they saw that they were floating. When a surgeon was performing a surgery, they almost died. And then when they were dying, they felt they were separated. And from the roof of the operating theater, they could see the surgeon performing the surgery on the body. Not one case, thousands have been recorded like that. An out-of-body experience, they could see when not in the body. But we are so many people, very few get that NDE. Can we also get an NDE without D? <laughs> Can we also have the same experience without dying? Well, the mystics have been saying it can be done and they call it dying while living. That is the whole subject of the spiritual path that you can discover who you are by dying while living. That means you can have the experience of separating your sense perceptions completely from this body and see the body separate from yourself. Which is the self? The body or the sense perceptions? That's what comes up immediately. If you can do that, and by the way, with a little practice, all of you can do that. If you can do that, that separates your self as sense perception from physical body. What would you call yourself? You just step away. What would you call yourself? You will look at your body and say, this is the name given to my body by my parents or when I was baptized or when I was named. Somebody gave a name. Is the name given to this body or to me? Big question. And who am I? If the body is separate from me, I've just separated myself and I can see my body separate, who am I? What am I made of? 
will these questions arise? We say these questions arise because we have a brain, a physical brain. Physical brain is sitting in the body and we are having the questions separate from it. What kind of brain are we carrying now? That without the physical brain, we are still asking questions. Without the physical brain, without the physical body, we are still imagining things. We are still talking to ourselves. We are still using our entire five sense perceptions. Who are we? Big question. But the question becomes even more intriguing. When we say, do I have my memory? Do I still retain my memory which I had when I was in the body? In the body I remembered when I had my breakfast. Now I find the breakfast was given to this body. But I tasted it. I saw it, I tasted it, but the body had it. What is my role compared to the body? The body looks completely lifeless now because I must be the life then. And I have moved out. That means life or the ability to be aware, the ability to be conscious was not in the body, but in the sense perceptions. Well, we have used a certain term for those sense perceptions and we call it the astral body. Somebody gave this name. They wanted to give it a body, name of the body. But they, many people say it is the soul. The soul has moved out. And may, when that body dies, this soul will go somewhere else and go into another body. Maybe currently be prepared in another mother's womb. But is it the soul or just sense perceptions? But one thing is sure. It seems to have something in it which was in the body, the power to think, still has a mind. That means along with the sense perceptions, the mind has also moved. A very big thing. If the mind has also moved, the mind was not a function of the brain at all. Now this is something that only that person can truly say who has had this experience. Supposing you have no such experience, you will say, who knows whether it is true or not, maybe the body contains everything. But if you have once that experience, that when you are able to put your sense perception aside, you carry with it not only your mind, but you also carry with it your consciousness, your ability to be aware. Therefore, the body is merely one cover upon ourselves becomes absolutely clear, then is that creating the reality? Obviously, the body can't create a reality, the sense perception which gave us whole reality has moved out. Therefore, we then begin to realize the power of sense perceptions and then we try to remember. If we do this exercise regularly and have a good experience, in and out, in and out of the body. If we have a good experience of separating sense perceptions from the body and we do it on a regular basis, we will get so used to it, we will know we are using the body, now we are leaving the body. It almost looks like I am putting on my red jacket today, I am taking it off today. It will be like that. Therefore, jacket will never be me. But if I never do it, jacket is me. This misidentification with a cover upon ourselves, which is unable to generate reality unless I am sitting inside this cover, is a great information, piece of information. It's a great enlightenment. It's a great realization that you are not the body, but something that wears a body, like a garment. Very interesting. More interesting when you say, is the memory that I had in the, in the body, I was a child, I remember, some 
traumatic event of childhood I remember. Do I still remember it? Of course I do. It had nothing to do with the body. It had nothing to do with sense perceptions. Memory is not in the sense perception. Memory is not in the body. Memory is in the mind. The mind has moved along with my sense perceptions. Therefore, I am carrying the memories in the mind. Are the memories different? If you separate yourself regularly, if you don't separate regularly, it's a very strange experience and you get back, jump back into the body. I don't know I am going to die. Maybe I am dying. It is dying. That's what happens when you die. The sense perception leaves. Therefore, it becomes very interesting if you practice this ability to move out. Move out or what they call vacate the body or take off the body temporarily. Not, not permanently. Permanent is pure death of the body. Take temporarily is dying while living. So if you take your outset from the body and start remembering not what you remembered in the body, if you start remembering what you remembered in the astral self, in the sense perception alone, you will start remembering things that happened a hundred years ago. Not somebody else's event, your event. You weren't even here in the body. But the sense perceptions were there. Same sense perceptions. Same mind. Same power of being aware. Same consciousness. So that is why it's a very useful experience to discover that what your sense perceptions are creating this reality is not confined to the age of the body. If you are good enough and your memory is sharp, you can remember things as far back as a thousand years ago. You can even remember the previous bodies you wore, the different garments called human bodies you wore in the past. And if you wore some strange kind of other costumes, you can remember that too. It's an amazing experience. Of course, much greater experiences lie ahead of you if you are on a spiritual path. Because spiritual path does not mean finding the astral self. Spiritual path means discovering the spirit. Spirit is still hidden inside the sensory system. Spirit is still hiding inside this body of sense perception, the astral self. Why do we call it astral self? Because the word astral has been used in the reference to the sky. And when we are in this body, we see this sky. This sky is lit up with artificial light of suns and stars. You remove the suns and stars at a dark. Therefore, this sky is not really a great sky. At night, it becomes dark because the earth turns around the other side and it, you, the stars are too far away to light it up enough. And we see darkness. In this sky, we see light and darkness. Do we see light and darkness in the inner sky? No, we don't. There is no darkness. Nor is there very strong light. These extremes that come here of light and darkness disappear. I'll try it out. By the way, it's not that difficult to have that experience I'm talking of. That is the most uh, Fundamental experience on a spiritual path, the ability to separate your sense perception from the physical body, to vacate the body. And the method is actually extremely simple. The method is to realize what is making you aware of this body, first of all. If you examine carefully, you are aware that you have a physical body because you are putting attention on it. It looks a little odd. We think that we have to put attention when we want to put attention, that we are not always putting attention on something. No, we are always putting attention on something. We are putting attention that we have this around us. Putting attention, there is matter around us. Putting attention, there are all these atoms and molecules around us. And from the body, they are all around here in the physical world. It's a continuous play of our attention. 
our attention is continuously there. Not only that, we eat food, our attention is out. We see people, attention is out. Every experience, physical experience of sense perceptions takes the attention out. Starting from the body into the whole world. So we have scattered our attention. It's the scattered attention that alone creates our experience of the body as well as the physical world. If this is true, why not reverse it? If the scattering of attention is going out, creating these experiences, why not withdraw attention back to the point from where it's being scattered? And that's the important thing. Where are we scattering our attention from? Is there a single point from where we scatter attention or is there a large area from where we are scattering attention? If you examine this, the nature of attention, you put attention to read a book, where is the attention coming from? You are imagining something and putting attention on some far off place. Where is the attention coming from? You want to look closely at these beautiful flowers. Where is the attention coming from? It's not coming from anywhere outside. It's coming from the body, physical body. Is it coming from hands and the feet? No. From the belly? No. From the head? Through the eyes? There is some area in the head very close to the eyes. Because when we use our sense perceptions, the two main perceptions that we use for putting attention are vision and listening. And ears and eyes are both placed very close up in the head. There must be some relationship between the point where we put our attention on the world and the head and the location of these eyes and ears. The truth is, it does not take very long. You close your eyes and contemplate. Where am I thinking from? Where am I trying to reach out from? Where is my attention flowing from? You find it flowing from behind the eyes. You open the eyes. That's where you're looking out from. You're listening from the ears. These two things determine the location of the origin of attention. Draw two lines, we have two eyes, draw two parallel lines back into the head. Draw one line between the two ears. You create a little bench in the middle of the head. The point of attention is right in the middle of the little bench that we create. So specific. Completely identifiable. Right behind the eyes, between the eyes, between the ears, in the center. It's a very well defined place. By the way, since the attention flows from the air, and attention is creating our whole experience of objective reality, it's very important to know that point. That point has significantly been called the point the center of consciousness, the center of awareness, the third eye. Third eye for a different reason. I'll give you the reason for why we call it third eye. These two eyes don't see the same thing. They cannot. They're located at a distance. If you put a figure in front of you, you and you look at the distance, you see two fingers, one more dominant than the other. Then you close one eye, seeing one finger, other, seeing a different one. One finger is being seen as two fingers by two eyes, naturally. The two eyes are always seeing two different things. We don't see two different things. Where are we combining them? When we go to 3D movies, we can combine them by wearing artificial glasses. Sometimes they make, they used to make movies, 3D movies. One movie was painted green, one was painted red. And in the theatre they would give you glasses, one green, one red. Green saw the green only, red saw red and they combined and looked like a 3D. Now they are using a different method. 
because now you can separate the two eyes depend on the axis and those are new glasses they have come up but the division is still the same to combine two images on the screen look like one and creates a three dimensional experience can you imagine our three dimensional experience with two eyes is generated exactly the same way except the two are combining not outside but inside where they combine if i put my fingers like this like they combine here that's how they combine exactly at the point which i described third eye that's why they say the two eyes cannot see the third eye sees even now we use two eyes to see the objective world from the third eye so we are always at the third eye when we are awake and conscious ultimately it comes out we have to be conscious and aware before we can have any experience of this kind so when we have that experience at the third eye that is the point from where attention is going out easy then if you have found that out that the point of origin of your attention is right behind your eyes inside your own head put all your attention there if you put all your attention on your third eye what will happen you begin to withdraw attention there it's not focusing of attention don't mistake these two words are very different the process is very different to focus means to move away from third eye you cannot focus on anything without moving away from third eye whatever you pick up as an object of focus you move away from third eye to focus on it focusing means moving away from where you are withdrawing means pulling back to where you are now that's a little practice we need practice why do we need practice because right from childhood we are taught how to focus our attention never taught how to withdraw attention this is something new for us not very difficult once you understand the difference how you can use the two also the method is simple if you want to know i tell you right now the difference between focusing attention is that you have a separate object separate from yourself and you focus on it withdrawal is you focus on your own self and you know where you are you are at the third eye center behind these eyes between the ears how do we reach that in order to withdraw a beautiful method given to us imagination we imagine we are there what could be simpler we imagine we are sitting in the center of the head that's not difficult at all imagination is possible for everything we imagine we are sitting in the center of the head and we are thinking of nothing else but what we are doing there the more we think of what we are doing there more we are pulling our attention back is called withdrawal of attention when you withdraw your attention what happens you become unaware of other things on which the attention was placed earlier this is this is a very beautiful gift we have otherwise we could never have found what our soul is what spirit is what mind is if this ability was not there granted to us the ability to imagine the ability to withdraw your attention the ability to concentrate your attention wherever you like these are very great gifts given to us and these are the gifts that we use in what we call meditation to discover ourselves we imagine we are sitting behind the eyes we think of nothing else and concentrate our attention only on what we are doing there in an imaginative state people ask me what are, what are you teaching just uh, tell people to imagine things no i am not saying that start imagining things i am saying use imagination for the purpose of withdrawing your attention that's all use it as a tool use imagination as a tool to know that you are now thinking of nothing else except your third eye center and therefore you are withdrawing your attention there and it works try it out it works when it works and you the imaginative self sitting there 
slowly does not know what's happening outside. Especially if you close your eyes, even close your ears, and be in a quiet place, dark place. It's very easy to start imagining and being there. If I tell people, imagine you are there and you are there, they'll say you're making a fool of yourself. You're just talking of an imaginative self. No, I am not talking of imaginative self. I am talking of using imagination in order to withdraw attention and see if you can then still be your sense perception and your mind and your awareness, but no body. That's it. If you can achieve that, you already achieved one step of vacating the body. That's the first step. You have achieved dying while living. Therefore, imagination is only being used as a tool to learn how to withdraw attention. If we had other means, easier means to locate ourselves at third eye center, we could take those. But the easiest I found is imagining you are there. It's very simple. So when you do that and you discover that your imaginative self becomes your real self. Because the memory that opens up is the same memory that opens up if you were to leave the body and step aside. You have virtually vacated your body without moving anywhere outside of your own head. A virtual experience of vacating your body and being independent of it and only living now with your sense perception or the astral self is a very great experience. And as I said earlier, if you do it regularly, your memory will trace back. You don't have to go to people who say, we'll tell you your past lives. You will know your past lives better than they can tell you. The memory opens up so much. Next step on the spiritual path, even more interesting. Very much more interesting. You can withdraw your attention within that imaginative self also. Because when you imagine yourself, you imagine yourself in the same shape as this body. You are so used to thinking, I am like this body. I have got my eyes, I have got my ears. You have the same stuff inside me. You don't th think you are different from that. So the same head you have got inside, same legs and same hand and same belly, you know, but except there is no matter in it. It's all just sense perceptions with no matter. So the inside head, you are still thinking from that head. You are still remembering from that head, not from this one. You become unaware of this head. You become unaware of this body. When you are thinking from that head, meditate on the third eye center of that head. This is your head. It's not somebody else. It's you in a greater reality than your physical body. When you withdraw your attention, you become unaware of sense perceptions. First time you discover, first time, this world was not objective at all. It's completely been created from what you discover is yourself inside. Then you can say what the science is finding out today is lying inside us all the time. And we can discover it. What are we discovering now? We are still thinking. We are still thinking in words and images. No sense perceptions, no physical body. How are we thinking? The mind is still there. So what is left of our self? What we call our self? And we think the body is our self, we vacated it. We think sense perception is creating the world and that's our self, we vacated that. What is our self? <clears throat> Just a thinking machine, which we know is our mind. Mind is still there. That means mind survives, even the physical body, survives the astral self. How long does one mind live? With your own experience you can find out. Based on a simple thing, memory. How far back can you remember? 
In the body, you can't remember very far. In the sense perception, you remember way back. In the mind, you can remember millions of years. The whole origin of the universe, you can find out. It's a very amazing experience. To discover your mind, there is nothing like it. That's the highest goal one can atta attain through meditation. I don't have any higher goal. Very beautiful. Then for the first time you can say with confidence based upon your own experience, I know the whole world is being created from my mind. The whole picture of who I will see, what destiny I have, is all being generated from my own mind. I don't need science for that. I'm finding it for myself. I'm remembering how it happened. It's my experience directly that I can see all this. My mind is functioning at its highest level of efficiency. And you can see many more things which look very interesting at that point. Why did my mind generate an experience of sense perceptions and a further down experience of a physical objective reality in which I created rich people, I created poor people. I put myself somewhere in the middle. I created very sick people, people suffering, and I created very healthy people. I put myself in the middle. Why can't I pick up a nice battle for myself if I'm making it up? There should be some good reason why I was so stupid that if I made the whole universe, I could have picked up the best place in the universe. This question I am now asking, I will not ask there, by the way, but I can ask now. Because we take this objective reality as real. The moment we find it not real, how does it matter? This question has been answered by reference to an old story, The Canterbury Tales by Chaucer. Old book written 300 years ago. In that story, Geoffrey Chaucer writes about a pilgrimage to Canterbury in England. And he says we are a 40, 50, some large number of pilgrims going to Canterbury. And since there was no fast traffic moving like planes or cars or anything, they were going on horseback, some were walking. It took a lot of time, many days to reach Canterbury. To pass their time, they are telling stories to each other and they are singing songs and they are reciting poems just to entertain each other. And he describes all those characters. This book has become very important in English literature because for the first time in writing a story, an author has differentiated the character of the different actors in it. Before that, once upon a time, there was a king and there was a queen and the king did this and he died. It's the end of the story. Now, a very generous king, very jealous king. These characterizations started from that book, first time in English literature, where he began to describe the characters by their character. Like he describes an attorney, a lawyer. He says, a busier man than Nos, that he never was. A busier man than Nos, and yet he seemed busier than he was. Looks like a modern attorney. Or there was a wife of Bath. Bath is a town in England. And he writes about her. Husbands at church, she had five without an other company in youth, but I need not talk of that note. <laughs> Things like that. This was the first time he describes the character of the people. So the novel is very important. But the most important thing is, that Chaucer says he was also one of the characters. And he was a character in the story. The others ask him, Chaucer, you are a great author. Come, you come and tell us some nice poem. You've written so much poetry. Come on with some. He says, I am not a poet. I don't know any poetry. 
He said, come on, we know who you are. And then Chaucer comes up with the worst doggerel rhyme in the whole book. And they all criticize him. They know he's, he's done a very poor job. The question has been asked, if Chaucer is the author of the book, he could have taken up the top position. Why did he put himself in a place where he could be crucified by his own creation? This has sometimes been referred to Jesus Christ. He was son of God. He said he was one with his father, had the power of God, and crucified by his own creation. The two are great examples of how when you have full power of creating something, it hardly matters whether you are crucified or you crucify. It's a story that you are writing. This discovery comes to us only when we are at that state no sense perceptions, no body, mind alone, generating our destinies and we create any number of destinies and pick up anyone that we like. It's a wonderful way. I sometimes refer to those destinies like DVDs we have been prepared there. They are all prepared there. There is no other place. You can check. What I am saying with you is something which can be verified by personal experience within yourself. Don't have to go anywhere. The whole treasure house of this information and knowledge is lying in your head. Just go in and check all this thing. Now when you find that it doesn't matter what character you play, so long as you are all the characters. If you create all the characters, you are all characters. How does it matter which one you put your Put your own self into as an individual. What is happening now is we are conscious minds have generated a story for ourselves which we call life. A life which has perceptions and a second life in which self perceptions are covered by another form we call physical body. And we have chosen to watch this show we created it, we put it on a stage. The stage is called time space. Time space is merely a stage created to put our drama on it. We put the drama and we can watch it from heaven also. We can watch it from a distance. Like we watch movies. When we go to see a movie, the movie is taking place on a screen. It's not even real. We think it is real. Because we can laugh and cry with it. It's only a reflection of something already prepared and being projected from behind us. Same way here. The whole story or destiny of life is being already prepared, sitting in the head, being projected by awareness, consciousness, outside, through the mind, and we are seeing it outside. There's no real difference except there's a match. Multi-dimensional screen, that is a two-dimensional two screen. Now, when we sit in the movie, some murder is going to take place. We don't run to stop it. Why? We take it as real, but don't interfere. It's a very strange way which we manage to balance our credibility that is real and our knowledge in a, in a back of the knowledge is not real. If it is not real, we won't enjoy the movie. If it is real, we will go and stop it. So look at the balance we are creating. A balance that an old Greek philosopher once explained to us, Aristotle. Aristotle justified why we should go and see tragedy. He said tragedy is the highest form of drama. Comedy the lowest. And history somewhere in between. These are three types of drama they used to put up. All of Shakespeare's works can be divided into these three. All great dramatists' work can be divided into these three. They said tragedy is the highest. In tragedy, you are able to see tragic circumstances that happen in life and yet you watch and don't go and interfere. You cry with it. You feel anxious for the characters, but you don't interfere. Why? Well, he thinks that we willingly suppress 
our knowledge of the truth temporarily just to make it real and he explained it in a beautiful way that drama has to be like that in order to make us identify with the characters and get rid of our own emotions he think the basic reason for drama drama of life or drama on a stage is to remove the excess of our own emotions it's a very interesting way here how he is presented it when we want to make the drama even more real supposing instead of sitting in the audience we decided that particular actor if i went and said in his head i will see the drama much more realistically and we go and sit in the head of a character look what like what drama it look like this is the drama of life we are going through we have still not reached the spiritual path at all in spite of all this we just found that our mind generates everything and when we study the mind we find another secret i think i'll take a break let you think of the secret and share it with you in the afternoon session thank you